This call is being recorded. She would sleep. She would wake. She would walk. This is the No Fear Podcast. We know what scares you. I'm Matt. I'm Mel. And I'm Lisa. And this is the No Fear Cast, the podcast where we dissect horror and all the things that scare us. This is episode nine of season five, and we are continuing our watch through of The Haunting of Bly Manor. This episode, we are discussing Bly Manor episode eight. So, excuse me there. Um, in our last episode, uh, if I remember correctly, Lisa and I discussed episodes six and seven of Bly Manor. And then we had a mini in between that episode and this one where we talked about the Henry James story, The Jolly Corner, which is um, the title and thematically connected to episode six of Bly Manor. So this time around, as I mentioned in the intro, we're going to be talking about episode eight, which is, um, let's see, it is it's the Romance of Old Clothes, which is a Henry James story that we will be talking about uh, in our next mini. But today we are going to be dealing with the episode itself. And so I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start out uh, the episode as we typically do and say, Lisa, this is your first time watching episode eight, The Romance of Certain Old Clothes. What, as the, as the person who's watching this all for the first time, which I kind of forgot earlier today and accidentally put an article in our doc that had a spoiler in it and had to rush to tell you before you read it. <laughs> What did you think of this episode? Well, I did not see the spoiler, so I could still finish Fly um, unspoiled, I guess. Although I will say I have a remarkable um, like ability to forget spoilers. So I have had so many things spoiled for me and then I've immediately forgotten and watched it and been like, wow, that's so cool. <laughs> um, but... Bly episode eight. First, I want to say I was really excited for this episode. Um, I already knew pretty much what the plot was going to be if it was anything like the story, because this is probably the one of the Henry James stories that I know better than the rest. And because we already knew there was the lady in the lake and she was faceless. And then there was the faceless woman upstairs with the trunk. I kind of had a sneaking suspicion that this was going to be their backstory when we learned about those ghosts. And I was right. And I was very pleased with that. Um, I will say this. I loved, uh, I loved the way this, the story unfolded because we learned in this episode about uh, the two sisters, Viola and Perdita uh, Willoughby, uh, who lived in Bly. I, I honestly do not remember the year. Did they give us a year? It was the 1600s, like the mid 1600s. Okay. Yeah. I, I knew it was, you know, um, a few hundred years back, but I, I didn't write that down, but I loved, um, I loved how they told this story in black and white. I thought that was really beautifully done. I loved that even though I was watching Bly Manor every once in a while, and I think because it was shot in black and white, it took me out of it a little bit in a good way because I'd be watching it and I'd be all caught up in the story I was watching. And then suddenly I'd see like the staircase or I'd see the doors to the parents, um, like the forbidden wing close, you know, these parts of the house that were, are so familiar to us now watching the show and I would almost forget I'd be like oh yeah we're in Bly um so it was a little bit eerie seeing Bly before like it became haunted <laughs> really um but it was a lot of fun I thought watching it and again I really loved the way it was shot I thought it was very beautiful I thought the costume design was beautiful I thought the acting was well done um so yeah, I, one thing that I really appreciate is the way this, um, and, and the Haunting of Hill House did this too, but the way t 
time not only like folds in on itself when you're in one of these Mike Flanagan stories, but also the way like dialogue repeats. So in this one, we heard it's you, it is me, it is us, which we had heard before with Quint and it became so terrifying. And this time it was very sweet because it was between Viola and her daughter, Isabel. So I liked that quite a bit. Um, we also got the O Willow Whaley, which is what opened the entire series um, because we had Viola walking the, the, uh, the halls of Bly as she was falling sicker and sicker. And she was just kind of walking in the dark and singing, um, which again, I liked that. I liked how everything just kind of added up. Um, one scene in particular that I loved, and I'm skipping ahead a little bit. This, um, the scene where Perdita dies, <laughs> um, where her like ghost sister finally comes back to get her, I thought was really well done because it was a completely silent scene and the rest of the the rest of the episode kind of had this like i don't know mournful like background music um and that scene was completely silent except for just the rustling of the fabric uh which i had i took note of that i was like oh that's really great we're listening to the you know the rustle of the fabric and it's this you know we're really paying attention to the fabric and then oh no <laughs> so that kind of got me. Um, I thought that was a pretty good jump scare. Um, and again, we there was the theme of covering mirrors and kind of, I noticed that um, one of the major themes of this, um, of this particular season seems to be not just what personally haunts a person, but and, and what turns them into the haunted people that they are, but also the idea of wanting to avoid things, wanting to avoid past mistakes or wanting to avoid the like truth or re the reality of things and um, how that can kind of add to what's happening. So they they played up that nice. So yeah, there was just a lot of nice like callbacks I thought in this episode. Like it explained a lot because we learn obviously who the lady in the lake is. We learn who the lady in the attic is. We learned the uh, a few more ghosts because we had kind of spied, um, you know, like a kind of preachery character and and of course the plague mask. We had seen that before. So we learn all about their um, backgrounds. But yeah, I liked the way it kind of, it felt cohesive in the series. Like it didn't just feel like, okay, now you're going to hear the background of all these ghosts that you've been seeing. It just, it, it felt thematically cohesive. I liked the way the dialogue flowed and kind of went back to other episodes. Um, so yeah, overall, I'd say I really, really enjoyed this one. Yeah, I uh, the first the first time I watched this episode, I had actually not read uh, James's story, the romance of certain old clothes, and so it was just me getting the episode, and then afterward, I read the story. So I thought that was kind of interesting because my my first impression of it is the is the Bly episode. My second impression, the James story. So I think it's gonna be interesting to talk about that story because they do make some changes. Um, I enjoyed it. Um. I liked the decision to go with the black and white, which makes sense since one of the influences on this is the 1961 movie, The Innocents. Um, and, you know, Mike Flanagan has talked in interviews about how he and the, and the director, um, I hope I'm not mispronouncing her name, but Excel Carolyn, um, wanted that black and white, like 1960s classic horror movie feel. Um, and there were a couple points in the movie, especially when she's singing the song from The Innocence, but when she's walking down that one hall and the shot is of her in the mirror, like headed toward it. And the shot is kind of almost like wavy looking or like almost like a, 
rounded or I don't want to say like fishbowl type look because it's not that that's not that extreme but there's like a distortion to it and then it shows her kind of off kilter and then the mirror again reminded me of that um, scene in 1963 The Haunting which Mike Flanagan talked a little bit about in one of the interviews I read that movie and there's a scene when uh, I believe it's Eleanor is going down the hall to this mirror and you see the shot. And I was like, wow, that just seems pretty, you know, very similar to that. So you can kind of see the callbacks. Um, and apparently the director, she used those kind of a wider lens to get that kind of feel that you got in the 1963, The Haunting, and in some scenes of 61's The Innocence. So I thought that was cool to kind of see those those callbacks. Um I thought it was a neat way to, if you're going to tell the history of Bly Manor, it's like a long, long time ago. So you have a narrator, which is very Jamesian, as we've talked about before, but also kind of, you know, you're going back and the narrator wasn't intrusive at all. I actually liked the way they did that. And then in the black and white to kind of separate it from what's going on in the present. So the, the present with Danny getting attacked by the lady from the lake bookends her story. And I liked that, um, that choice as well. Um, I thought it was cool too, because I remember one of the things that we talked about, we talked about the haunting was that we didn't get the stories of all the ghosts in the house or the past of the house. And apparently from things that I've read since they were all ready to shoot an episode that would tell you that, and then they just didn't have the money or the time on their schedule. And so it ended up getting cut. And so I thought that that was interesting. I would have liked to have seen like what that was going to be. Um, but I was glad we got it this time because the, the lady of the, the lady of the lake or the lady at the bottom of the lake is just so important. I can't imagine Bly Manor without this particular episode because you really need that. And as you mentioned, Lisa, we have all the little callbacks, like the, the a lot of what's going on in Bly and present is kind of explained by seeing what happens between, um, uh, Viola and her sister Perdita. Um, it's a couple other things that I liked about the episode. One thing I thought was really interesting was the way the sister's relationship was portrayed because you have these moments of immense closeness and love between them at the beginning, even when they're trying to marry Arthur. I think Perdita kind of knows that Viola is going to end up marrying him. And the idea is that Viola doesn't care which one marries him because the girls are trying to keep control of Bly Manor, which is interesting. Um, and then by the end is Perdita that kills Viola because of the way that their relationship has changed and it's a major shift and a curve but it works in the episode which I thought was really heartbreaking when you see the picture of them as girls together in the bed uh and you're reading articles or whatever it's just terrible that th the way that they end up of course and then the other thing I thought was cool is as a Doctor Who fan I love the Doctor Who references in The Haunting of Hill House and I really like the Doctor Who references in this one as well uh, with the uh, uh, her going on for years and years and years and years and years doing the same thing over and over again, learning what happened and then forgetting and doing it over and over again. It was very similar to uh, like Peter Capaldi's episode Heaven Sent where the Doctor is trapped in this house and keeps doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and not quite understanding why, which which kind of goes back to the haunting of Hill House and the idea that, you know, we're all just made of words. And when someone forgets the stories and they start to forget us and you see that actually happening to the lady in the lake as she starts, as she fades, like as the narrator tells us, everything does. Um, so those are just a few of the little little things about the episode that I thought were cool or kind of caught my eye. Matt, what were, what were your impressions? Well, um, I'll be honest, the first time I watched this, uh, I was a little put off by the, it felt abrupt shift. Um, by the end of the episode, I had come around and, and did like the episode, but the sudden change in, in time, the sudden change in characters, it, my first thought was, oh, great. So now we get the, the backstory episode, but, um, <clears throat> You know, I, I, I'm glad I saw it through and kept watching. I, I really did enjoy the episode, even the first time I watched it. And then watching it again was, um, it, it it was a better experience, I suppose, because I went in knowing what I was going to be watching. And I, I thought it was an interesting story. I was not familiar with the James story at all before watching it. I still haven't read the, the story yet, to be honest. Uh, I do want to. 
I just haven't had the time. I, I think one thing, and, and I agree with both of you about the, the things that you've touched on so far about the episodes, um, I, particularly the, the forgetting, which I thought that that might be what was going on when we'd seen the Lady in the Lake in previous episodes and could not see her face, but I wasn't sure. But I, I think one thing that neither one of you mentioned or, or didn't go super in depth with, which I hope we might discuss a bit more in depth in this episode, is the sheer force of will of Viola, <laughs> that she basically persists through a terminal illness for years through force of will, and then persists through death with such a force of will that not only does she survive, but she essentially creates this black hole on the grounds where anyone else who dies gets sucked into that orbit as well. And I, I thought that was a really, really interesting idea um, that, that someone's willpower could be so strong that they could, well, I mean, in, in a way she sort of cheated death twice. <laughs> she lived much longer than she was expected to. And after she did die, um, continued on even um so yeah yeah i uh, like yeah i really i really liked the way they characterized her and especially because she is i mean the episode like last up ep the last episode we watched ended with danny being dragged off by her in a very terrifying moment and then this episode started that way and ends that way <laughs> <laughs> because we're still kind of stuck in that moment. We're just getting the background. Um, and she's such a terrifying ghost that I loved getting her backstory because Matt, exactly what you were describing her, like her sheer force of will and stubbornness was what endeared me to her as a character in the episode, because like when she refused she well first when we meet her she's the two daughter part of the oldest of two daughters so she and her father has died so she knows she has to marry in order to keep Bly like a float basically like there's no way for her to be able to manage a, a house like this without money and the only way she can get money is to marry and she goes through all these men, you know, kind of looking at them and being like, no, 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 no. And, and she has her way of testing them. And then at her wedding, when she wouldn't say obey, <laughs> I thought that was great. And even then, um, when the doctor comes to give her the death rites and she refuses to participate at all in it, like she refuses to repeat the words. And I just, I thought, I love that determination in her. I, I really loved that character, um, the way they built her up. And I think it it made me feel differently now towards the 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 idea of the lady in the lake as a ghost. Because when you contrast that with like a Peter Quint, like Peter Quint is terrible both as a ghost and a, as a human. <laughs> you know, I mean we we talked about that in our last episode about just, you know, Peter Quint is just evil. And she was just, she was the opposite of that. So I, I enjoyed getting to, getting to see that. I enjoyed getting to see, you know, that she wasn't necessarily killing out of any malintent, but she was caught up in her cycle. And any, it was just anybody who happened to be unlucky enough to get in her way. And honestly, we find out that really she hasn't killed that many people. I mean, in all the hundreds of years she's been there, um, at least that we saw. So I, I appreciated that too, because you, you, I don't know. I just, I, I had a, a fondness for her. And I also felt uh, very deeply when she was separated from her daughter, because I think you feel her love both for her husband and her sister and her daughter, but especially her daughter. And when she just, when her daughter had to be taken away from her, um, of course we're living through, you know, a time right now <laughs> where I think that, that this episode hits a little bit differently, but when she gets sick and she can't be close to her daughter for fear of, you know, getting her daughter sick, so she essentially has to quarantine. 
that was, um, that was difficult to watch. Like I, I was, I was affected by that. Same, same. Uh, it definitely had a pretty strong impact on me as well. Um, I, I definitely empathized with her and I mean, I think you're right to bring up this particular moment in history that we're living through because I don't, I don't know what my own reaction would have been had this, you know, been released last year before, before the pandemic was at its height like now. Um, I don't know, but I do know that that, that was a very affecting moment for me um, as well. Yeah, the... Uh... I mean, I'm sure when they were making, I mean, I assume when they were putting this together, because, you know, things are uh, uh, shot and produced long before they're released, coronavirus, or at least as bad as it has gotten, was not not a thing. And so, yeah, watching it um, and the isolation and the separation, I'm still not 100% sure how Arthur didn't uh, get it from her because he wasn't as separated from her as everybody else was, or, or Perdita for that matter. But um, yeah, it definitely had um, uh, more, I don't know, like urgent or contemporary feel, like the, the, them wearing the masks, you know, was something that kind of hit me and, and using their handkerchiefs as masks and the plague doctor outfit and things like that was definitely of a certain time. I think, I think Matt, I would have responded differently had we not been in this. Um, I also thought it was interesting how they played with the themes of... Oh, one thing I will say, Lisa, I think she had some bad intent when she killed her sister, but <laughs> there was also motivation for that. <laughs> well, you know, I was thinking about that and I was like, you know, she did have malintent when she killed her sister, but then also like, I don't think she would have gone after her sister had her daughter been the one to open the chest. Oh, no. No. Because that, that was what, uh, and we, we can talk about like that whole scene too, but like, I loved when she died and woke up as a ghost. And, and I realized, you know, pretty quickly as she was going around the room, I was like, oh, she's in the chest. Like, that's clever, right? And for her to be waiting all that time, like Matt said, just with sheer will, like keeping her going, knowing that like one day I'm going to see my daughter's face again. And that was all she had wanted. That's all she had wanted in life was to be reunited with her daughter. It's all she wanted in death. And like, I think she might have killed anybody who had opened it had it not been her daughter. But I also think that when she saw it was her sister, like all this rage boiled up too. So there was definite malintent, but I kind of think her sister deserved it a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to be um, on Viola's side for that. Her sister and the mercy killing, I put in quotations. Um <laughs> Before, I think we need to talk about that. Before we get into that, I just wanted to throw out there something that kind of builds on both of your points, and that is the fact that, again, it's so tightly written. We see the themes of love and possession in Viola as well, because Viola starts out with just wanting to possess and, and keep Bly. Like, she wants to keep control of Bly, so she's got to find the perfect marriage partner for her or her sister so that they can control it. And, you know, those first few days after her marriage when she's walking and she's very self-satisfied because this was a business arrangement for her. Um, you know, she she has the power. She has her, her creepy Scooby-Doo, like, portrait on the wall and all that, that looks evil sometimes after she's passed away and all of that. Um, but then as she goes, she her relationship to Arthur changes from, like, a business transaction to uh, love um she has a daughter whom she loves um and it's she does i do feel for her and i do see empathy and connection built in but there's also this idea of that also turning into jealousy and like wanting isabel to be her daughter not parted as even though she she does you know isabel never identifies with parted as a mother um but you see that and i think that's also in her willpower too is this i this changing perception of love and possession if that makes sense and I'm not trying to equate her with Peter Quinn at all I think you're right that she is a different ghost but I do I thought it was interesting how those themes kind of morphed and changed and got stronger or weaker through the course of her 
life because a lot of what was animating her was she wanted to keep Bly and the family, keep that and keep her family. Um, and those are very important things and I can support that. But I just thought it was interesting that it ran along those same themes that we see in the later relationships that are going on in Bly as well. Well, I think not just love and possession as an overall theme for the show, but just family in general. I mean, one could argue that all the people that live in Bly in, well, I was about to say the present, but in the 80s <laughs> when it's set are kind of a uh, a family of their own. Um, and, and so, but they're, they're, I guess, like the healthy version of a family. They're, they're a family that, that has... Uh, I guess, love without strings attached, uh, unlike Quint, and even in some ways, Viola. Um, but but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I hadn't been thinking about it in terms of love and possession much like Quint until you said that, but that's that kind of sparked something. I'm, I'm kind of digesting that. <laughs> well, and even the trunk. I mean, she wants to show her love for Isabel in the way that she thinks she can, and that's by giving her all her possessions. And for her, that means love because Isabel will have these things that don't mean anything to her anymore. And that's a connect. This is what a mother does for a child. But for Perdita, it's like, I can wear all this or we could sell it all and make money. Uh, it's just different and in, different interpretations. It, yeah. If, well, and if we are going to talk about like the idea of love and family too, I thought it was quite heartbreaking at the end when it is um, her husband and her daughter who throw the trunk into the lake that, you know, gets her into the lake because they, in, they did end up having to sell or at least get leave Bly. And for a moment, she she knew what was happening and she thought she was going with them and she thought, it's okay. It's okay that I don't have Bly. Like, as long as I'm with them, it's okay. And then she realizes that she's being, you know, quite literally thrown away by the only two people she cared about. And I thought that was, that was quite heartbreakingly beautiful too the way that was handled um I, I mean of course I understand it from Arthur's point of view because <laughs> he, he thinks he's in possessed of a cursed trunk <laughs> um which he kind of is but I mean it, that that was kind of one of the like heartbreaking twists for me is I don't think she would have become the lady of the lake had she not been abandoned in that way um I think if she had been allowed to go with her daughter that you know there's a good chance she would have just hung around and watched her daughter grow up and then you know leave because there there was a little I wish I had written it down there was a line where she said what she realizes I guess she's been left is that um you know, for a while she saw there, it was, it was something along the lines of for a while she saw the other side, like for a while she saw the light of the other side that she could cross over, but she ignored it. Of course, that's her stubbornness, right? But eventually she f just kind of forgets that that's even an option. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting to see what turns people towards revenge um if you can, if you can even call what she's doing revenge i mean i wouldn't really but yeah i don't uh, think it's revenge so much as basically i i, I read her at read <laughs> um falling back into the uh literary studies <laughs> <laughs> even though this is film studies i guess but uh but not, I, I read her her cycle the and what you used as the introduction for the episode that she would sleep she would wake she would walk um after she's killed perdita as almost it's like 
it's reenacting the trauma, but it gets to the point where the trauma itself has faded and she's forgotten what caused the trauma, but all she has is the hurt. And she, the only way she knows how to act on that hurt is through anger. Um, I, one thing, and, uh, I, I'm not no shame in saying this. I, I've been in and out of therapy for most of my adult life, <laughs> but um, one thing that a therapist had told me once years ago that really stuck with me was that um, anger tends to be a secondary emotion. That that there's usually a, a a primary emotion that you're feeling that leads to the anger, be it jealousy or frustration or or something, and. Um, in her case, yeah, there's the jealousy and then there's the hurt of being abandoned that expresses itself as anger, but she repeats this trauma so much and and over and over and over again that the the trauma itself is, has lost the meaning and all she has is the anger sustaining her. And so, I mean, I kind of read that as almost a, I mean, a nice mental illness analog there. If you just keep revisiting your trauma over and over again, you're not necessarily a vengeful ghost, but you're full of anger in a lot of cases. So mm. yeah, I like I like that a lot. Yeah. She's looking for Arthur and her daughter and she doesn't find them and then she lashes out. Um exactly. Yeah. And numerous and times. She, and like it says, it gets to the point where she, I mean, you know, she comes out of the lake, she walks up, she goes to the bedroom. She even gets to the point where she doesn't remember why she's in the bedroom, but she just knows there's something there that she's looking for that isn't there. And then she re-experiences that hurt and anger and then leaves. And yeah. Well, yeah. And also just to the, the idea of a desire being unfulfilled, you know, like mm -hmm. a desire that which, I mean, gosh, that that as a theme goes all the way back to like the ancient Greeks, right? But like the the idea of of desperately wanting something and not being able to get it. And so that becomes your own kind of personal hell. It's your own, almost a punishment of sorts. And that is what she's doing, right? Is is even as she forgets what, what it was she wants, that desire is still there. Um, because we learned that we we finally learn who the faceless boy is, you know, when when uh, the one that uh, Flora has been seeing and who I guess her uncle saw as a child. Um, but we see that, and it's the, it's the remembering of the desire, you know, and but not fully remembering what it was you desire because. I think part of it, we see her lashing out in anger, but then part of it, like when she took the child, it was just, oh, I wanted something. Maybe this is it. Like, maybe this is what I'm looking for and taking it back to. Um, and I think that's, that is a theme that kind of weaves itself through too. Cause we certainly saw that with Mrs. Gross's story was this idea of, kind of the tragedy of having a desire that is unfulfilled. Of course, I don't think she really realized fully what she wanted until after she died. And we, when we saw her trying to like change her memories um, to fit what she wished had happened. But I don't know, that's, um, I really like the way they're kind of playing this up. I mean, then of course there's Quint who's just terrible, but. <laughs> well, I, I was going to say, I think you kind of see, you also see the desire with, and I don't know why I'm drawing a blank on her name, uh, the governess. What What is her name? Uh, Danny or Jessel? Jessel. Danny. Jessel Danny. 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 Thank you, Danny. I was trying to call her Nell, but that was from her role in the last movie or the last series. Um, but, uh, but you see that in her backstory as well, too, because, I mean, her desire is that, you know, she is almost on this like um track towards marrying Edmund and oh, Edmund or Edward I I don't know why I'm so bad with names tonight but anyway she she's on this sort of like railroad track towards marrying him but I mean it, it's kind of hinted at that she's already aware that not only is she not interested in marrying him but that she's not interested in marrying any man she's gay and so I mean I I think you see that that desire as there as well and, and unfulfilled desire because certainly if 
he hadn't died, she probably wouldn't have married him just because she didn't really know what else to do and been completely miserable for the rest of her life. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think in the in our last episode, we talked a bit about what Quint and Jessel <laughs> desire too, but you see that in their lives and you see that in um, the Miles and uh, Flora's parents and uh, Henry's issues. De definitely. I, th I think this idea of like thwarted desire or pursuing desire and just all the characters pursue it in different different ways. Some maybe more disturbingly or damaging to others uh, than, than other characters do. Another thing I was thinking about, and I think this builds off what we're saying, but I think we talked about this with The Haunting, and we also talked about this with that movie, A Ghost Story, which I see some similarities with. One of the things that is going on here, and I guess it's from Mike Flanagan, since he's the creator kind of of these, is this view of dying is fascinating to me and also remarkably disturbing because it's really cool I think what they're doing with as you mentioned earlier Lisa time and loss and memory but it's like these people die well this is because of Bly Manor I guess this wouldn't happen if they weren't at Bly Manor in this one but it happened in Hill House too people die and they're like still dealing with the same issues they were dealing with and they were alive it's like um it's it's like the dead are going through a grieving process um like the living would like they viola doesn't want to leave the place because of her tie to it she doesn't want to leave the people because of her tie to them she stays there and creates this gravity well because she she wants to be with her family she is in some ways grieving like her family would have been for the loss of her but she's just like you said, Matt, going through repetition of trauma, repetition of trauma to the point where she's not even sure what it is that's animating her anymore and it's making her angry. It's like, it's interesting to me because these, and Hannah goes through the same thing. It's like this existential crisis of not realizing or understanding that you're dead. Or if you do, you're, you're grieving what you lost, just like the people who are alive would be grieving you if they know you're dead or if they knew you were dead, thinking of like Owen, uh, thinking of everybody, know, if they knew that Hannah was dead. It's really interesting to me. It's terrifying because I don't really want to undergo an existential crisis and continue having uh, <laughs> issues after I die, right? I mean, but this portrayal of death as this unmoored time of trying, like you're still trying to figure things out and you're still affected by these, for lack of a better term, existential fears, even though you're already dead. I think that is part of the horror of Bly Manor. Um, and it's also very human. <laughs> I mean, we don't know what happens to us after death, but it's a human way of looking at it because you're projecting human grief and mourning and trauma concerns onto a version of, hum of a human that is, is not tied to time or place anymore. It just kind of continues on and on. It's hard to even articulate because it's a, it's kind of this existential dread. Um, and, and I feel like that's where a lot of the fear and horror comes from with Bly Manor. is not just the danger to the people who are alive, but then what happens to you when you die there? I really like that uh, reading of it. I hadn't thought about it that way, but but I think you really like hit the nail on the head there with this being a very human version of death um, that, that these characters are mourning their life and their lost life and essentially coming to terms with their own death. Um, I like you, I kind of hope that that's not what the afterlife is, or at least not the beginning of an afterlife, but, but I, I, I really like that idea. I really hadn't thought of that until you said that, but um, yeah, that's, yeah. Um, so I've got a question and now I have not finished Bly Manor yet. I've only watched up to this episode. <laughs> um, but as far as I can tell, is Viola the first ghost of Bly Manor? I think so, because she's the one who creates the gravity well, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't think it would be a spoiler to say I, that I'm, 
I think she is too. So it is, it was mere, it was like the only thing that is keeping the other ghosts there are, is Viola's gravity. Like it is just her sheer tenacity and desire to hold on, even though she doesn't know what she's holding on to. That's keeping everybody else at Bly. Yes. According to the plot. Yes. I don't know how that works. <laughs> No, I like that. But I mean, it's it's also very, it like, it makes me like Viola more as a person and as a character, I think, because, you know, just, just to have that kind of, I don't know, but then it's, it's also, it's also very sad too, to think that, because I guess like everything, Mel, that you were describing about like the afterlife being this kind of confusing sometimes horrific existential crisis that like extends beyond our mortal life the idea is that they're they're kind of in a hell of viola's own making Mm -hmm. because i would assume like the rest of the people who aren't on like like uh the the children's parents uh, Flora and Miles's parents, since they didn't die at Bly, are we to assume they just crossed over to the other side and got to like bypass all this? That's what it That's sounds what like. Yeah, yeah. Because Flora says she's never seen them, that they're not going to come back. It's right. interesting because Hill House was also perceived, the interpretation of Hill House in that series was also as a receptacle for the dead. And Bly seems to be a similar thing, but we we have Viola's backstory to give us a reason. Like Hill House is just like here's a receptacle for dead where dead people get trapped, but there's no explanation for why. And in this one it's similar, but we have we have this very um strong, stubborn woman who's going to do what she needs to do no matter what even if death happens and it affects everybody after that. Um, Yeah. I don't know. I still don't quite understand it, but it's, 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 it's cool with her character having that angle, that idea of like such a powerful desire and strength to go on, but it's also tragic because I mean, she doesn't even know that she's doing it anymore. And she doesn't have an identity anymore other than the lady in the lake that everybody's terrified of. And I don't know. I mean, there's a there's an idea that you can just go on too long. That there's nothing like there's no place for her anymore. I think so, that's definitely what what happened is that she's gone on too long. I want to say something, but I also want to watch the next episode, so I don't want to say too much because <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't want to get in a position where like I say something and then you guys have awkward silences and I'm left to interpret those <laughs> <laughs> like we've had, had in the past. I, I'm just I'm very curious now about you know like what what would happen at Bly if somehow. If she does, like, if this is a case of sometimes you can just hang on too long, like, if she finally doesn't hang on anymore, um, like, would that be, like, the last final exorcism of Bly? Which, by the way, I loved the moment where there was, like, just the one line where she cut and she, you, we see her pulling the priest or the vicar, whoever he is, like, his dead body towards the lake, and it says um, she like almost missed her exorcism or she barely noticed her own exorcism. Um, (laughs) Yes. That one was was great. A really great moment in the, in the, (laughs) in the series. I was like, Oh, that's nice. (laughs) Um, (laughs) That's a really good vengeance on, you know, the fact that they kept coming over and over again for like six years, giving her the last rites that she refused to say it. And one of the people she kills is a vicar (laughs) and a plague doctor. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, it's inadvertent revenge, but there are kind of connections that run through the people that she attacks. Yeah, there were. The, all the stuff with the plague doctor, too, that that was a nice, I mean, it, to me, I was like, we didn't need that in the, it, it was like extra creepiness. I was, I appreciated it, but I, it wasn't necessarily, I think, to the plot, but like, 
just when she was getting sick and the, the plague doctor came and he was all dressed up in his plague mask. And, and then they tried the different like uh, bleeding and or bloodletting and the leeches, all the different things as treatments to heal her. Um, those were nice bits of creepiness, I thought, early on in the episode, too. So I, I appreciated those details. I think they seemed worse in black and white, too. <laughs> I was just like, are they really diagnosing her correctly? I mean, it, I'm, you know, all, all respect to people in the 1600s. I, that was rough. But I, I don't know. I mean, I guess ultimately she had tuberculosis. But That's what I wrote I mean, down. What are they even going to do to her? I, I mean, at that point, she is just going to survive on willpower alone because the medicine of the time is not going to get her through it. No. Uh, yeah, they. I think they, they thought it was the plague at first, and then they say it's not the plague, and, and they're very relieved. Um, but he says she has the lung, which I assumed meant tuberculosis. That's what uh -huh. I assumed it was, too. Yeah. It for what fit. it's worth, with my non-medical opinion. <laughs> yeah. My non-medical opinion, but my many, many years of reading 18th and 19th century literature. <laughs> right. <laughs> it fits tuberculosis. <laughs> That's true. Though she's in the 17th century, but I guess that happened then too. I mean, you get all those gothic women that needed to die from something kind of like bedroom. She -like. she wasn't as beautiful as Poe would make make her out to be. I did I did think that towards the end, because they had her looking pretty rough. Um Oh, and yeah. again, the black and white like lent to it, but you know, they had her and, and Perdita even at one point says like, you don't want your daughter remembering you this way. Like basically get it together. Cause she gets violent towards the end, um, which you can understand. She's upset. She's, she's angry at the world, but um, he always thought, I, I did kind of think of the comparisons of, um, you know, how somebody like Edgar Allan Poe would write a woman dying of tuberculosis and how it was just, you know, it was a very tragic thing, but it was also a very like beautiful thing. Um, well, Viola also would have used her willpower to possess Perdita's body. <laughs> if it was Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> True. That's how she would have kept living. <laughs> or just uh, waited until they uh, put her in the ground to come, <laughs> to come flying up. <laughs> that she would have burst out of the floor in the chapel and stopped that private wedding if it was oh, yeah. Po. yeah that's true um you know I liked the way they did play and, and I know you mentioned this earlier but I did like the way they played up the two sisters too because even at the very beginning there was a sense of like competition between the two of them and you could never really tell, I mean, you could tell they loved each other, but there was always like an undercurrent of meanness almost. Um, and I liked the way, like you weren't really sure, you know, oh, does, does Perdita, you know, is she just waiting until she can have Arthur? Um, or is she doing this out of love for her sister? You know, I just, I don't know. I um, I liked the way that they, I, again, I keep comparing them to, um, to Quint, but, you know, Quint is just so wholly evil. I, I liked that these two sisters felt very real to me because they weren't wholly good, but they weren't wholly bad either. You know, they just, they had things that they wanted and sometimes they went about them and not exactly the right way <laughs> but that's very they were very human so i don't know i really appreciated this i will say this i mean perdita i think it took her a while to think that she was going to replace viola because when they find out that she has the lung arthur's just kind of like well how long and perdita is like you she says like you will cure her you will treat her and then uh, when she refuses the last rites Perdita breaks in and says um what she tells her yes like don't go and then they're like well God wants her you know this is what God would want or whatever and Perdita says God should know better because he made her this way 
and uh yes I, I, those were, I think those were signals of their their um i mean i'm not saying that you're wrong to see some competition between the two of them but i think in the beginning there was a much more of a closeness there i feel like viola hanging on and hanging on and hanging on and part of being with arthur and isabel all the time and seeing a life she could have had kind of push the conflict um because Perda, she did want Viola to continue at first, I think, until she realized what that would mean. And you also, I mean, she's the main caretaker, too, and that's rough. I'm not saying kill someone if you're their caretaker, but that's, <laughs> she had Viola slapping her all the time, accusing her of things that she's not even doing at first. And it's just, it's, it's a realistic, I think, kind of portrayal of what would be going on between the two of them like as it as it deteriorates mm. if that makes sense absolutely i mean i still think there was some com- i mean there was competition for arthur i think since the very beginning since he oh, walked yeah. through the door yeah but um no you're right i think i think when you really look at it it was it was the two of them and Bly kind of against the world and i did appreciate um that line about you know guys God won't care that she doesn't do this because that's the way God made her, which I thought I took note of that line too, because I was like, that goes, that like flies into the face of like every, I think religious training a girl during that time would have gotten, (laughs) you know, it it would have been, um, you know, you're lowly, you're nothing you know, pray for forgiveness and hope that God takes pity on you, you worthless little thing. (laughs) I mean, that basically would have been it. And, you know, for them to be like, no, God made her exactly this way. So that means she's perfect the way she is. I really liked that, that, um, again, I don't know. I like these sisters a whole lot. I also liked that, um, the, the way they showed the passage of time, uh, because it did, Matt, you're right. It did go so abruptly in the beginning from there's Danny screaming, being like dragged off to suddenly we're back in time and it's black and white. And it's very clear that we're in a different story, it, but it was very abrupt. But then as we worked our way from that time up to like where we had been in the eighties, I really liked the passage of time there. Um, and they did that nice thing where as the ghosts became like more and more faceless, like basically the, as their faces were, um, smudging away, I guess would be the way of describing it. If that makes sense. They were just kind of like fading. Um, the color in Bly started to come back. So it was almost like the color was draining out of them and the color was bleeding back into Bly, um, which I thought was a really neat, just visual thing to watch. So um, I liked I liked seeing Bly kind of come back to the time we had left it in. And then, of course, you have Danny screaming again because she's being dragged off to the lake. So <laughs> that was very... <laughs> That was very intense too, but suddenly I didn't feel as, as I was still scared for Danny, but I didn't, I felt very differently towards the lady in the lake than I had at the beginning. So I don't know. Well done. Uh, well, I will say, I'll say this, uh, episode eight, the romance of certain old clothes certainly, um, I think lived up to its expectations for me. I thought it was really well done. It was uh, strongly and tightly written and just really, I think, beautiful to watch. So I think it was a lot of fun. I, I'm going to not give uh, my predictions for the next episode, which I guess is the last episode. That's crazy. Um I don't know. I I have some thoughts about how it might all end, but I I also don't want to think about it too much because I kind of like to be surprised a little bit. Um, I will say that I think we're going to cover the Henry James short story, The Romance of Certain Old Clothes, over on our Patreon. So I guess for those of you who don't know, uh, we do have a Patreon. And if you join... um, you can get access to exclusive content. So we have many episodes and 
uh, in the weeks in between when we do these main episodes. So you basically, our patrons get uh, weekly episodes from us. And it's been really fun because as we've been doing this Blind Manor watch through, we've also been using uh, the Patreon episodes to kind of talk about some of the source material. So that's always fun. Uh, so if you love what we're doing, you can consider supporting us on Patreon and again, get access to that exclusive content. Um, if you can't, and we completely understand because these are very, very difficult times for a lot of people. And we understand that you may not be able to give money right now. Uh, you can simply rate and review us. That is entirely free for you, but it does help us a lot because it helps other listeners find us. You can also just tell a friend. We would greatly appreciate just some word of mouth love. Uh, and then just as a reminder that we'd love to hear from you, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Uh, we're at No Fear Cast on Twitter and Instagram. We also have a Facebook page. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode.